our final discussion section and to our grad students. I do want to make one point that I feel like is sort of, we've been skirting around. So people are we're sort of wondering, you know, what is the Islamic, when do we call it the Islamic, what's an Islamic society? And the, the example I keep coming back to in my head is capitalism. We're in a capitalist society, right? And therefore we are all in some ways capitalists. And that doesn't mean that we're also not living in an American society or a Cambridge society or um, you know a global society or a millennial society. But when we want to engage the fact that we are living in a capitalist society, what does that add to our understanding of the life we are living? Um, how do we think about the ways in which we create meaning or act in the world today? And this sort of comparative exercise here makes me just wonder about academic disciplines in general. So why does, why does academics exist? We're trying to see the past better. We're trying to see the present better. So we're not trying to use all these lenses at once. The question here is if we're going to examine of the world, <coughs> in this case the Islamic world, as Islamic, what does that mean and what does that add? And so I think it's really just important to remember that this is not, you know, some question in a vacuum. It's, it's, it's a capitalist thing. So that's my own. I, I lost confidence. Okay. So I am going to now introduce two grad students. Hadil Jarada, PhD candidate in Nelk, to speak briefly about the student reading group she coordinated this semester along with Axel Takash, a PhD candidate in the study of religion. <coughs> Unfortunately, Axel himself can't join us today as he is participating in a conference in Iran in the Balkans to Bengal complex itself. Over the course of the reading group, which met over a number of weeks in the spring semester, Axel sent us his review um, sheets for every chapter and session. They were really incredible and comprehensive and demonstrated so much respect for Shahab and his work, which I, of course, found very, very moving. I benefited greatly from attending sessions of the reading group. Arafat Razak, is that how I was going to say last name? Yeah. PhD candidate in History and Middle Eastern Studies, will also join us, as he is here. And he's been asked to speak if the spirit moves to any common themes that have been addressed in both the reading group and at today's symposium. During our final Q&A, which will happen shortly, Arafat and Hadil will remain a part of the discussion, underlining the importance of Shahab's work to the graduate student community. I'll be very brief, hopefully, uh, since we are all quite exhausted, I'm sure, and we're at the end of a very long day. Um, so, as was mentioned, I will try to sort of sum up some of the main, or highlight some of the main questions that came up over the course of our uh, reading group this past spring term, uh, and which nicely um, sort of uh, parallel many of the questions that emerged today as well. So I'll try to, try to kind of uh, um, highlight those as well. Um, naturally, one of the things that we focused most on uh, in our discussions was precisely those passages in Shahab's book where he critiques the work of other scholars. Um, as Professor Nejibu rightly remarks, that you know, it may in fact be a blessing to not be quoted. Um, one of our, one of our uh, uh, sort of something that we kind of reached a consensus on was that Shahab somehow had the ability to identify, no matter how large the corpus of somebody's scholarship is, that one particular quote <laughs> that makes you gasp in disbelief that <laughs> somebody so esteemed could say something like that. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll, and then I'll also mention in this mode of sort of typical graduate student uh, tearing apart the book, um, I'll, I'll refer to a footnote, and of course, as I said, footnotes um, is. They're, they're just uh, what makes Shahab, and I also happen to be a favorite part of my book, a uh, favorite part of the book that I like. Um, he says, in his critique of Hans Kuhn, the distinguished Christian theologian, his book, Islam, Past, Present, and Future, which he refers to in a footnote on page 14, it's an 800-page book that Shahab describes as rather like a good undergraduate essay. <laughs> so rather like good graduate students, we focused on what Elias Mohanna in his review on the nation last fall said, uh, you know, Shahab sort of resignedly uh, told him that those are the bits that graduate students probably will end up putting. They did. So of course the problem of the insider versus the outsider, or the box, if you will, 
Uh, obviously a recurring question, particularly in anthropology, uh, but also for those in the study of religion. Um, we, we grappled with it. I don't think we solved it. I think we agreed that Shahab is trying to do both, both looking out, but also looking in. Uh, one of the things that I think we found was interesting was his appeal to, or really his stated desire for an edic and a panemic uh, concept that, uh, of Islam, that both um, allow scholars to describe a phenomena or a historical uh, period or whatnot, but at the same time that it does justice to the notions and the concepts and the terms um, upheld by the subjects themselves, whether uh, anthropological or uh, ethnographic subjects or historical subjects. Uh, the question of sincerity, which I'm glad Professor Michael Cook brought up earlier today, uh, that was something uh, that play, uh, sort of really um, stayed with us throughout our seven sessions. Uh, put differently, what is the role of the necessarily implied agent in the hermeneutical engagement? Right? making meaning as a Muslim. What is the role of sincerity here? Um, but it's, again, it's one of those questions that I don't think we solved. We debated it a lot, sometimes heatedly. Um, but I want to suggest if perhaps we could step out of that to some degree, um, especially to look to literary criticism, right? where um, they have managed to do away often with authorial intention uh, with regards to the meaning of texts. Texts often mean. Uh, regardless, right? uh, in fact, almost always, regardless of authors' intentions. Um, and on this point, um, perhaps uh, I think Shahab's, um, it's worth noting Shahab's appeal to what I think literary scholars would call you know, sort of a kind of reader response criticism. Note how, for instance, in, in Shahab's view, to understand Hawker's, it is not really enough to analyze the literary merits of his poetry, but also to take account of the fact that he is the most cited, the most widely read, the most, we all know that famous, um, that the phrase that Shahab uses to describe Hawker's. So, so to think about that model, and, and that's something that strikes me in particular because of my interest in uh, another field that I think Shahab had a lot of interest in, which is book history. Um, not, not just in the sense of the book as material object, but all, also its implications for the relationship between text, author, reader, and, and, and publisher, and printer, or copyist, or masters, all of the various actors that are involved in the, both the production of texts, but also in determining the texts. Um, and also on this note, I want to acknowledge and also bring to your attention Shahab's material contributions to Harvard, specifically Wider Library, um, in helping acquire um, a huge collection of South Asian uh, early Indian printed works. And if you follow the footnotes, you will notice that Shahab often cites early, sort of late 19th, up to mid 19th century, early 20th century editions of classical texts, Persian texts. Um, that were printed in various parts of um, then British India. Um, and in fact, we have here with us Michael Grossman, who worked closely with Shahab uh, on this project for about the last 10 years, during which uh, Shahab was closely involved in the acquisition of something like over 20,000 books. This is unparalleled, and I quote Michael Grossman, this is unparalleled in the Western world and will probably make for a new sort of generation of South Asian studies. And I think that's worth uh, attending to, just because I think, you know, when it comes especially to these classical texts, many of us uh, just only focus on that text, forgetting the larger reception history of that. I want to close with uh, a metaphor, if you will indulge me. I know I'm running okay. longer than I promised. Um, and this is in reference to what I find interesting as a historian and um, also relating to the question that I posed to Professor Kappar earlier today, because I'm, I'm very much intrigued by what Shahab's book means for this period as a work of history, even though, of course, this is largely a work of conceptualization and, and a theoretical intervention. Um, and I found myself thinking of uh, the classic, the medievalist classic, which is Johann Heisinger's uh, The Autumn of the Middle Ages, otherwise uh, known by an infamous uh, shorter translation, The Waning of the Middle Ages, uh, without losing sight of the differences between the two books. And this book was really influential, written in, originally in Dutch about 100 years ago. Um, and there's 
I began to notice all kinds of interesting similarities. Some of the chapter titles from Kaizen were the passionate intensity of life, the craving for a more beautiful life, the forms of love, the forms of thought in practice, and art in life. Uh, there are other ways in which, of course, the medieval world and the way in which it was described, especially by those who took in art, uh, like Heisinger, um resonate, I think. So Heisinger says of how uh, symbolism, I thought symbolism was very nearly the life's breath of medieval thought, the habit of seeing all things in their meaningful interrelationships and their relationship to the eternal, both due to the boundaries between things and kept the world of thought alive with radiant, growing, glowing color. Um, and lastly, the, member, the reason why I was thinking of this metaphor of the autumn, the autumn in all its intensity of color, brightness, but also maturity. Right? So in, uh, in, in the final pages of his book, acknowledging, sort of preempting, right, um, the critiques that he will face, and of course those are the critiques that we have, in fact, raised in our discussion, I think his ninth point was that, you know, people will say that this, is, this only applies to mature Islam. And that is, in fact, the thought that I had over and over again. Uh, but I want to think about appreciating this account of mature Islam um, in its own terms, or in its own light, for what it is. And I think that the metaphor, the memorable image from Heisinger's preface um, is perhaps worth remembering or recalling. Heisinger describes his own book as concerned with the end of the Middle Ages, as the age of medieval thought in its last phase of life, as a tree with overripe fruits, fully unfolded and developed, the luxuriant growth of old compelling forms over the living core of thought, the drawing and rigidifying, the end of the end, drawing and rigidifying of a previously valid store of thought. In writing this text, my eye, he says, my eye was trained in the depth of the evening sky, a sky steeped blood red, desolate, with threatening leaden clouds full of the false glow of copper. Looking back at what I have written, the question arises as whether, if my eye had dwelled still longer at the evening sky, the turbid colors may yet have dissolved into utter clarity. It also seems quite possible that the image, now that it has given it contours and colors, may yet have become more gloomy and less serene than I had perceived it when I started my labors. It can easily happen to one who has his vision trained downward that what he has perceived becomes too decrepit and wilted, that too much of the shadow of death has been allowed to fall upon his work. And of course, he was referring to the initial shadow that the anticipation of the Renaissance and the end of the Middle Ages had on the legal historiography. But if I may twist his words, as our own evening draws near and the end of a long day today, I think it's fair to say that from, far from letting the shadow of closure fall upon his book, he has definitively breathed new life into the study of Islam. Mm -hmm. Will come up also, so we'll have our final Q&A. And in speaking in the fall, here's our photo of Shahab in the fall. <laughs> 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 OK, so I can ask our first question. <laughs> okay. um, this is a, I'm early in my own study of this book, um, but I noticed that there's no panel today on philosophy. So I wanted to bring a philosophical framework to bear that seems to me it might illuminate Shahab's project and also criticisms of that project and applications of that project, such as Firemel offered. So the, the framework is from the philosopher Ronald Dworkin, who taught here for some, for some years. And it's his theory of interpretation that I'm thinking of. And he describes the interpreter as making two pairs of intersecting judgments when interpreting anything. And for Dworkin, interpretation is not just of texts in a narrow sense, words on a page, but also of practices, um, games, anything could be interpreted in this sense. So the two pairs of judgments are you attribute a point, purpose, or value to the enterprise, and then you read whatever the practice or the text is in light of that attributed point, purpose, or value. The other pair of judgments is you make a judgment about what fits the practice or the text and at the same time makes it, among those that fit, make it the most the valuable that it can be. So a simple example that I give when I teach this is the commercial for Ego Waffles where the kids are saying, Lego my Ego. 
And you say, okay, well, that actually has a meaning in ancient Greek. Lego in the middle voice means to choose, and you, the, you have the personal pronoun ego, but you don't need it because the, the, act, the actor is indicated by the verb ending, so it's really emphasis. I choose this thing for myself. So this is a Rousseauian child who's asserting independence in, the, in an alienated, mass-marketed, frozen food culture. <laughs> now, what Wharton would say is that to interpret that, you know, you all now agree that that's the proper interpretation of the commercial, but <laughs> for those who don't, um, you have to attribute a point, purpose, or value to the enterprise. So many people say, no, it's not about ancient Greek, people don't know ancient Greek, this is just to sell products. This is just a little, you know, ditty that, you know, they're using to create a meme to sell products. Um, but if you want creative interpretation, engagement, um, you know, reaching into abstruse things, then that would be your value. Does it fit the text? Does it make it the most valuable? Now, it seems to me that the interp th this fits, this model of interpretation seems to fit Shahab's own project very well. Right, so what is Islam? The importance of being Islamic, attributing a point, purpose, or value, and then reading the, the vast range of actual texts in the narrow sense and practices, including wine drinking and dancing and singing and what, whatever, interpreting it in light of that attributed point, purpose, or value. Or find, making a judgment about what fits the text and makes it most valuable, but Dworkin is careful to say that even the judgment about what fits is informed by the judgment of value. So it has a kind of circularity that I think picks up the discussion between Nicholas and, and, and the Noah early in, or earlier in the day. There is, a, or actually there was the other fellow here who was <laughs> arguing about the circularity, right? There is a kind of circular dimension because your judgment about what fits is informed by your judgment of what's valuable and your judgment about what's valuable informed by your judgment of what fits. So applying this to something like Parimel's um, uh, beautiful analysis of Buddhism and Hinduism, I was surprised, and I want to offer a friendly amendment from this point of view. Um, when you said that there's no text in Buddhism, I mean, I would think that, you know, Buddhist practitioners, if they're in the Theravada tradition or, or the later Mahayana traditions, the Theravada traditions would all sort of recognize many of the things in the Pali Canon, Pali Canon including the first turning of the Wheel of Dharma or the Eight worldly winds, or all of those texts, uh, the four noble truths. I mean, that you know, if you don't have that, then you don't have Buddhism. And the texts that explain that would seem to be, you know, a, a, an essential part of the practice of Buddhism. Um, but I guess so. My question is: Does this seem? And, and by the way, religions themselves would be practices in this Dworkinian sense. Obviously, Islam would be one. Christianity would be one. So this picks up Professor Watson's analysis that. You know, there's a, a and I'll, this is, I'll close with this, there's a fascinating woman who runs, she's a Lutheran pastor covered in tattoos, and she runs a, a, a Lutheran church that's called the Church for All Sinners and Saints, and she has a version of the Lutheran uh, liturgy and so on, but again, it's all because of her judgment about what fits the reading of the Lutheran tradition and what makes it the most valuable. That seems to be what you have in Shahab's own method, and it seems to be an account of what people are doing when they apply the method or, or disagree with the method, and so that's my question, <laughs> suggestion. <laughs> I'll start with the simplest part, and I'll pass the rest on down the line. <laughs> the, the point of talking about pretext, text, and context in the light of Hinduism and Buddhism was to show that the vocabulary is helpful if only to help us see relevant differences. So the point with Buddhism was actually not that there wasn't a text, but that there were too many texts, in part because, as you know, in the Indian world, there are so many Buddhas, and there are so many words for Buddha. So the, the point about no text was in the Hindu case, the idea that you have something like Veda, which in a way is not textual and has no origin. What about the Bhagavad Gita? So the issue is what the status, of course there are, there are words, and there are words that get put into books for manuscripts. The question is, what's the status of that? How is it understood within the framework of what Shahab's calling pretext, text, and context? If one takes, depending on what kind of philosophical theologian you are, and what your attitude towards, say, a text like the Gita or Veda itself is, my feeling is that the people I was talking about in, the in a certain group of pre-modern thinkers, that their conception of that is actually not as text at all. 
but really as a pretext. And so they're going directly from pretext to context by engaging in a hermeneutical process with this context. Whereas in the case of Buddhism, you have, in a way, all three, but with a plurality in the middle. So it, that was just a way of trying to work with what Shahab gave us to understand how we can use that to see both similarities and differences in a productive way. The question you raise about Dworkin and about whether the hermeneutics there best captures and the idea of this resonance, right, the resonance, if you will, the kind of harmony between the, the particularities over here, right, and the, I'm not going to use language, but, and the, and the production over here, right, and you're suggesting kind of harmony. The one thing I see with Shahab's work on this point is that, in a way, I don't know Dworkin will have to say this, but I think even with the insider-outsider distinction, mm -hmm. and I think that what Shahab suggests is that you can't start with that. That to decide what's inside and what's outside, what the particularities are and what the bigger things are, is something that can only happen at the end of it. Mm -hmm. So I wonder sometimes whether a certain modification of reflective equilibrium of a sort might be a better That's way exactly of looking what at Dworkin it. Did. Yeah, okay. a non-circular, in a sense. I don't see the circularity problems there, but that's just a take on it. Yeah. Well, I don't. I don't. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. So, I, so I, the only thing I'd add is that I, I do prefer Shahab's phrase engagement, word engagement, to Dawkins' word interpretation. Um, I think interpretation is a narrower thing than engagement, and engagement mm -hmm. uh, can be meaning being acted upon as well as acting. Um, so to me, that's important. And actually, one question I, 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 I'd had for, for Islamists is, is actually what is the, what, so what's the, um, is this an inside or is this an outside phrase? I mean, what, 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 what Arabic words is he thinking with uh, in the phrase hermeneutic engagement? It works terribly well. It seems weirdly portable, considering how unportable he claims his paradigm to be. The fact that I think I can use it for medieval Christianity should not be. And <laughs> so just, I, I, if I'm allowed to ask a question of the audience, does anyone know the answer to that? <laughs> I have a question. Very simple one, I'm afraid. Oh, no, but you know the answer to this question. No, oh, okay. Yeah. No, okay. Yeah. Yeah. The answers to the someone, question. Someone will say. Can I say one thing? I, the, the portability seems misleading, though, in the sense that if hermeneutical if her, if her engagement oh, okay. is intellectually productive, mm -hmm. right, whether it, it would be an Islamic version or not is going to depend on a very detailed account, right, of the yep. nature of that engagement. Absolutely. So the question is whether hermeneutical engagement is something that is, it could be a kind of, of that the inside-outside question may, be the, may not be the one that we want to ask, but that you can follow the engagement image, it's the productivity and the particularity of that engagement. That Absolutely. Yeah. 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 I don't know what the answer is. I would venture to say he's using the correct English word, That's which was um, mm -hmm. his favorite game. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. <laughs> that might be the right. answer right. to this. Right. Can you know better than can I ask a question? Professor, do you have a question? Well, I have a kind of, I'm trying to form it intelligently, but it's not very smart. But um, so I'm thinking, as I think of the title, what is Islam, and what I, from what I've gathered, your things, I've only read through the book very, very quickly. You cannot write a book called What is Islam if, unless you are living in a context which is telling you what is Islam. So I'm wondering whether this is Orientalism phase two. You know, a response, a, new, a response to what on earth is going on today, and just as Said was a response to what was going on in the 70s. So is this, and, 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 and I mean it also in the sense it's really setting a new ground to think. Could we call in all the speakers to answer yeah. these uh -huh. questions? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are not today. done, you may think you're yeah. done. <laughs> I think the book is also, is that in part, yeah. I mean, I think when intellectual historians look at this book, they will see it in multiple contexts. One is the scholarly context, uh, in which it is a response very self-consciously to a Western tradition, overwhelmingly by, though not exclusively by non-Muslims. Um, and then um, they will also, I think, inevitably be interested in the Salafi, the rise of Salafism, which is engaged in the book. And I think the book is an intervention in those debates as well. There's also an interesting engagement with the practice of takfir, which is the practice of declaring your enemy to be a heretic. Um, you know, Shahab doesn't call any Muslim a heretic. He bends over backwards not to do so. But in the way that he works through uh, the secondary literature, identifying <laughs> the core, the key error, which is to call something authentically Islamic if it's legal and otherwise not, 
there's something, there's more than a little bit of that kind of hinting out at heresy. <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry. I, I know he we had, he had started earlier. Oh, you're going to answer. Great. Yes, I. <laughs> Good. Answer. I thought he was open. Mm -hmm. No, yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, in fact, thought of bringing up Edward Said. I think there is something to it. It cannot simply be characterized as such, in my opinion, but there is something to it, a response to what's happening. That was the gist of my comments about authenticity and inauthenticity, uh, the way Shahab understands them, and how that could constitute an empowering intellectual leap for, 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 for many uh, readers of the book. But also, I thought of bringing it up because of some of the critique that is made about this book, which to me seems, which reminds me of Edward Said. You know how often he was criticized, Edward Said, for not bringing in the Russian or the German Orientalists. And the, there's a point to this. It's an important thing that I sometimes feel is missing, but it doesn't go to the heart of the argument of that book, which after all is not about giving a historic account of the nature of Orientalism, but it's speaking about the paradigm and, and, and developing an argument for a paradigm shift. So in that sense, B2B, I take very seriously that Shahab's delimitations may be limiting for us, and one needs to get out of it. But I don't think this is a very serious issue in terms of the negotiation of paradigms that Shahab is really after. I would, I would just kind of further add to that. It's also been on my mind, this comparison. And what I, what I was thinking of in invoking Heisinger was precisely the, the historical fact in scholarship, if you will, that some of the books that have been game-changing are often very flawed within the sort of their uh, discursive context. So if you, you know, if you want to take Edward Said to task for being a bad historian, which many of us do, I personally do as well, but it nonetheless had a, had a sort of a field-changing effect and continue to do. And I suspect that the same in some ways will probably happen with Shahab's book as well. As we agreed, I mean, it's not, necess it's not a work of history per se. It's, even though it does give you a very vibrant account of this period, 1350 to 1850, but there's a sort of larger conceptual uh, kind of intervention that may have a life of its own, regardless of those issues. Okay, question, sorry. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, you know, I'm afraid my question is very simple. Those are good. Um, <laughs> I've, I've heard the words prov provocation and engagement used you know, to describe Shahab Ahmed's book. Um, but the subtitle of the book seems interesting, you know, the importance of being Islamic, as if there is an allusion to being earnest, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. and earnestness suggests being humble and being inviting rather than being provocative in a way. So my question to, to Watson, to Patel, and the others as well, to ha has the book, um, What is Islam, uh, made Islam approachable or the other way around, in your opinion? So, Neither by training nor by field am I someone who has spent a lot of time thinking about Islam. So I can just speak for myself. To me, it has made Islam much, much more approachable. It has provided me with a perspective, with methods, with insights that resonate with the way I've thought about other religious traditions in very different places over a long scale. So for me, I actually see what is Islam as a, actually a perfect model for what a work in religious studies should be. It's a, it's a work that on the one hand is historically grounded, mm -hmm. it recognizes that the issues have passed, it's one that is comparatively informed, it's not one that thinks that these issues and questions and texts and interpretive methods are only from one place, it's, it's quite broad, and it's also normative in its own quiet way. So a work that is historical, that is comparative, and normative at the same time is what a work of religious studies should be. And so to me, this is one of the first books in Islamic studies that I've actually read and been a part of that has done that for me. So for me, it's only opened up. It's the second most important book about Islam I've ever read. The first was um, a, a, an Islamic catech catechism I was sold um, in the um, Suleimani in Istanbul when I was uh, 19. 
um, and which I learned off by heart over uh, a number of months and, 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 and um, thought was remarkable and, and, and uh, compared in detail to my own very different catechetical training. Um, but um, I, what I love about the book is I don't think it is a, it's a historical book in the sense that it deals with a period, but I, 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 the thing I find wonderful about the book is that it asks extremely um, difficult questions um, and, and for an academic um, goes to it in this, all this business of leaving the, leaving the town in heavy traffic means that one's exposed to all kinds of models. Um, I'm reminded of um, the Lord appearing to Elijah in the Book of Kings. He's not in the fire, he's not in the wind, he's not in the water, he comes in the still small voice, except that Shahab's voice is not still and small when we get to it. Um, so so um, I, 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 I have that sense. But I, the thing I cherish most about the book is what is obviously its idealization of its subject. Um, it actually seems to me like a pastoral. Um, the 500-year period doesn't feel very differentiated within itself. The, bang, the B2B complex feels like one <coughs> big thing. Um, and it's obviously a book written against certain kinds of self-evident historical violences um, of the period and of other periods. And I think that's the way that you communicate something urgent about something precious. And so that's what I like about it best. Just uh, kind of related to the, that question, uh, one of the things I found least convincing about the book, and it bothered me as I read it, um, was the, the problem of incommensurability, that, or the project of incommensurability that, that Shahab was committed to, at least in the middle part of the book. Um, and Professor Watson's uh, talk dealt with this. Um, the need to have Islam be something different, fundamentally different than Christianity. The, 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 the eschewing of all possible categories that originated in a European Enlightenment context to understand Islam. And I just found myself sort of yelling at the book often, saying, why, you don't need this. You don't need to go down this, in this direction to make this other brilliant argument. Um, but Shahab was so much smarter than I was, than I am. So uh, maybe there is, or maybe he did have to make that argument. And I'm still thinking about why, what that did for his analysis. And I, I was waiting for you to tell me <laughs> to answer that question for me. As you, near, you got to the end of your talk and you said, do you think that this actually, the book will create a basis for a more meaningful, more sustainable yes. form of uh, comparative religious study? Can you envision what that basis could, what, the, what, what, where we're going? If, if he is so, when he is so, so committed to a kind of politics of incommensurability in this book? Can I just add a bit yeah, to this question? <laughs> It, it, and and this is both to Ilias and to it's Professor good. Watson. In terms of this question of incommensurability, did you feel that there, it, it, it might be in varying degrees with respect to different kinds of Christianity? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or is it just Islam and Christianity? I think he took on board a kind of the, the Talal Asad um, apparatus, I think, which I was undetectable from, from my perspective as a student of his during his first few years at Harvard. It didn't seem to me that he was at all invested in that framework, that, he, that it informed any of his ways of approaching Islam. And then at some point, it did become very important to him. Uh, but it's, it wasn't evident to me that, but he, he seemed to take it and really just push it to the max. And, and he felt that it was crucial for his argument. And I couldn't see that connection. And I felt that it would ended up being a liability for his argument. But as I said, he was, you know, he knew what he was doing. So maybe, maybe Noah has some insight. Uh, well, um, I actually think, think he found culture uh, more seductive than religion. And so I don't think the, the chapter I was working with, I don't, I don't think it's the best chapter, um, quite, um, because he can't do anything other than provide a if he's, going to, if he's going to take on Christianity in some sort of way in order to show how the language of religion is inappropriate, there's not much he can do except, except produce it as a straw man in some sort of way. And so, so he kind of duly does that, um, while occasionally suggesting that he knows he's doing that. Whereas when he gets to culture, um, he's much more engaged and nearly trapped for a while. So, so I don't actually, I, I'm not really, I'm not really sure if I accept the terms of the question because I just find the quest so exciting, um, and and I think that the the a, a really 
hard. I mean, I don't know any of the scholars' concerns, so I, 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 they're all outside my field. So I'm not really worried when he digs at X, Y, or Z. Even Hans Kung, who I revere, um, and it's a good. It is a good undergraduate <laughs> essay. That. Um, so, so I, 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 I think the review of how different templates don't work when one's talking about a complex religious system, and how particularly. Um, um, the realm of, 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 of the, the, the need to distinguish that grew up in this post-enlightenment period, and culture comes out of that need to distinguish. It's not part of the secular, sacred, profane um, distinction, but it is, a part, it, it is a product of a social studies, studies project which starts by defining the field of culture um, as something which is going to be initially primarily secular. Um, it's going to be basically uh, early modern and modern post-Protestant Northern Europe is the kind of place where culture grows up. And then it's going to take on little bits of other things, including perhaps religion. And as that complicates, then it the, becomes a question of whether religion can be incorporated into culture or not, which is like the question of whether we should have a div school or not, isn't it, in a way, whether it should all be in the Faculty of Arts and Sciences. And that, you know, that's a live cultural question. But I think the question, I think he's right that you can't, use the terms of that question if you are going to if you're going to really try to define something if you have to come up with a simple template you can't you can't use those terms i don't know what the the follow up is um, i think the follow up does have to work with 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 objecting to his idea that there are no analogies mm -hmm. so i do think that so i think you have to say well what approx of tradition uh, versus his context um, you would have to say well what would happen if we if we approached these <coughs> analogies. I was thinking about this actually in relation to the agonizing and now highly uh, bureaucratic protocols of um, ecumenism within Christian denominations, where what you do is you take 17 versions of the doctrine of transubstantiation and you spend like 40 years trying to work out you know, how it is that they differ or don't differ. I think you'd have to do something on, on that kind of level. You'd have to do it piece by piece. I think this is called <coughs> dialogue. Um, but I'm not sure if that's quite the word I want to introduce. <laughs> I just want to say two, two things in, in response, and they're both under the heading of, I don't think the book has a politics of incommensurability. Mm -hmm. I think it not has a, an engaged, earned set of observations that lead to some suggestions about this. And one thing that struck me is that in Nicholas's very brilliant accounting, I mean, in there, somewhere in the complexity of the detail was the, I think, if I read you correctly, the acknowledgement that the dominant way of speaking mm -hmm. about um, Christianity in comparative religion faculties mm -hmm. today is in fact the one that Shahab is working with, but yeah. that, that is not the most, that if someone were to do for Christianity, and certainly for medieval <coughs> Christianity, yeah. what Shahab has done for Islam, they could do mm -hmm. something quite, quite similar. So yeah. I think that in the first place, his primary point is to identify the dominant way that the field of comparative religion speaks about religion to show quite correctly mm -hmm. that it's derivative of a certain view of Christianity, parentheses, which may not be correct, and then to say that that paradigm works very poorly and serves us intellectually very poorly when applied to Islam. I think that's sort of the first key point. The second about the earning is, I, I also felt myself constantly reading the book asking, well, what about medieval Judaism, which was so indebted to medieval Islam <coughs> that it has its own poetry, philosophy, and mysticism, all of which are deeply interwoven with Islamic tradition, so much so that you almost think that all of the things in the first six questions could be asked about mm -hmm. Judaism. And so I sort of thought to myself at every page, well, yeah. surely Judaism is the same. But then actually, yeah. by the end of the book, I realized it's not true, because the sixth question, mm -hmm. um, you know, the deep, the wine contradiction, if we don't have, even though there's threads of antinomism in medieval Judaism, other than a tiny number of extreme, you know, outlier movements that immediately identified as not Jewish in some way and collapse, you don't have any sustained religious practice committed to an act which is a core violation, which is a violation of a core legal prohibition. Right? It would be as though in Judaism there was some, you know, consistent group of elite uh, philosophers who thought that the eating of pork was central to their religious expression. It just, you just don't have it. And so, you know, in the end, I ended up being convinced by Shah that on the contradiction point, which is really the point he's making, when he says this is so distinct, it's about the welter of contradictions. I actually ended up convinced that, um, at least when compared to Judaism and Christianity, 
one doesn't find something similar. I don't think that Shah was thinking about Hinduism in that That's context, but I, I think if really pressed <laughs> conversationally, he might have been open to the idea that Hinduism had something in the background. To so in both Hinduism and Buddhism, we have precisely those contradictions, lots of them. Um, but the, I think the key difference is that Shahab is trying to figure out a way of holding this all together. And that's why I think he finds the concepts that are off the shelf, that, are, that many of us have spent a lot of years working with and are kind of committed to, inadequate. Those are inadequate for holding this set together. And I think that's the key. So when, I, when, I, when people complain about, not, not you're complaining, but comment about the incommensurability, my question is, well, first ask yourself why you're so upset about it and then figure out exactly how to use a concept that you think you can engage with in that particular way. I mean, I also find the issue of hermeneutical engagement, which is so central, that's not necessarily a concept that's either off the shelf or you know, you're going to find a simple translation that captures what's going on. So there's another kind of framing of the argument that is neither here nor there, but is really meant to be something that helps, that, that's either both or neither, and a question of how functional it is. So, I think a lot more work needs to be done before either a criticism or defense of the so-called incommensurability is, is undertaken. Just, just so I, but I distinguish between the, the question of whether it's uh, whether Islam is being presented as a, a unique object or a unique class of objects, and I think I think that's that's the question. I think it's a unique object, but not he's not. I think I don't know is right. He's not necessarily as I initially thought he was, um, arguing that it's a unique class of object. And you know, poor Shahab was going to write more and read more, <laughs> and this really? covers this book, as you see in Michael Cook's draft, as a conversation with himself. And I mean, he was already too slow for tenure. He had to stop at some point and stop himself. <laughs> and this book sort of does represent an abbreviation. And someone said, you said, an essay. It's an essay. And it's a draft essay at that. And so I think it's good that we're continuing this conversation. I think we should take this in mind, knowing he was going to write more and do more and flesh his own ideas out. And if you've met him, you know that he was open to change, which I think made him a brilliant scholar. So one more question, then I'm going to wrap up. Yeah. This is more a statement, but I'm, I'm, I'm happy to hear any comment on it. The, the subtitle, um, uh, The Importance of Being Islam. Yes. <laughs> I, th I think that he's speaking to us as human beings. I hear it an invitation, <laughs> and so I think on some basic level, uh, I, I may be just projecting all over the board, but uh, I think on some basic level he's saying it's important for human beings to be Islamic in, in the sense of being that capacious and that exploratory as he describes in this book. That's the correct. That's correct. That will turn us very, very well to our conclusion. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I couldn't have scripted this. <laughs> Remembrance of, of Shahab this year have rightly included or concluded with poetry. A lover and translator of all kinds of verse, Shahab was in his own way nothing if not a poet himself. Um, as you all know, the poet Hafiz plays a major role in the text and concept of what is Islam. In the hospital last summer, Shahab, if feeling all right, was always willing and able to discuss one thing above all, namely his book, and especially the poetry in it. What is there by Hafiz, which you can find on page 64 of your Kindle's text, <laughs> became a sort of chorus to which we would often return during the long hospital days and nights. One day when Shahab was feeling up to it, my brother-in-law had the very good idea of recording Shahab recite what is there from the hospital bed, first in the original and magnificent Persian, and then in his lovely English translation. We can only imagine what Shahab was thinking, reciting such existential lines with such intimate understanding. His cadence and inflections are translations all their own. I feel very sad today that Shahab is not here to speak for himself, and so I thought I would try to give him the last word in whatever way I was able. And so I will play the recording of Shahab to conclude our symposium today. Um, I started the clip at the beginning of his English translation, at the end, you will hear his Iranian friend talking and telling Shahab that he should translate the whole divan. To this, Shahab says, I'd like that, mm. oh, before <laughs> reciting one last line in Persian. So, I hope you can hear. So this is my translation. Better than pleasure, better than the conversation of friends, than the garden and the springtime. 
What is that? Where is the wine barrel? Tell. Why are we waiting? What is that? Every moment of joy that comes in hand, take it as a gift. No one has knowledge at the end of this work. What is there? Life is tied by a hair thread. Take heed. Tend to your own sorrows. As for the sorrows of the world, what is there? The meaning of the water of life and the garden of Bilam. Serve for the save for the bank of a brook and agreeable wine. What is there? The abstinent and the drunkard. The abstinent and the drunkard are both from the one tribe. If we give our heart to whose charms? What choice? What is there? What does this silent firmament know of the secret beyond the veil? Claimant you quarrel with the curtain keeper. What is there? If the cruelty and infidelity of the beloved are not taken into the reckoning. What then means the grace and mercy of God? What is there? The ascetic desire to drink from the fountain of paradise, and half is desired it from the wine cup. God's will betwixt the two. We shall see what is there. It's there, it's <laughs> it's a very good translation. It's not the word. I like that. That is a very good translation. Zahid Shalab, the person of Arthur's Tiara, I cast. Father, may I not have cast that kid with kid with God, Jesus. Thank you.